everybody. I'm really excited to have everybody be part of the group and super grateful to Heath and Carol for opening up their classroom tomorrow. Um, they'll be taking us through some context and background on the work they've been doing to get ready for tomorrow's Socratic seminar. Um, and we've got some stuff that we will show you on the TV, but we've also shared everything that you will see in the Google Drive folder that I emailed out earlier today. So um, I'll let Carol and Heath jump in and take over if you want to get us started by just talking a little bit about the focus as the um, Common Core speaking and listening standards for fifth grade and that could take us on. Uh, well, the strategy itself is the Socratic seminar format. And so technique, strategy, kind of similar. Um, just reading kind of a definition that I found that I felt kind of captured everything with that. Um, this is according to readwritethink.org, and it says the Socratic seminar is a formal discussion based on a text in which the leader asks open-ended questions. Within the context of the discussion, students listen closely to the comments of others, thinking critically for themselves, and articulate their own thoughts and their responses to the thoughts of others. So if you look at this sheet right now, it kind of explains the common core standards that are being used in this lesson. And so this technique, um, we feel like does an excellent job um, hitting these standards. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot happening here. And one thing we'll touch on later is the fact that within the discussion, there are multiple other ELA standards that get brought into it. They may not be a priority standard for this, but they still are brought into it. So it's integrating many different ideas all at the same time. Um, and listening skills. and speaking skills too, of course. Mm -hmm. So I guess do we want to give a minute or two just to sure. maybe just read through them on your own. So if that is our focus area, then if you want to take them into the background on what's been going on in the class leading up to this point, and who's in the class, and that kind of information. We'd like to talk about the context part. Sure. Yeah, the context of this story, or the, the class. Of the class. So we cluster groups the extended learning um, students into, into two different fifth grade classrooms and one of those is Mr. Kelly's classroom so those are identified tag students and then they are clustered in there with, um, with in a regular classroom with other students and so then I team teach with um, with Heath um, the schedule this year is that I've been going in every other day during his seventh um, hour class and we team teach and work with uh, I work on projects with the students and, and projects like this and um, we're working through, you know, putting that together, and this is this has been a really great um, project that we we've, we've done with the students. So that's the makeup of the class. And there's a wide range of ability levels. So we have ELP students here, but we also have some other students that might struggle at times with comprehension. So mm -hmm. we had, and that factored into our text selection later that we'll talk about. Uh, one thing, just in background, is I use a sound system in my room. And it's from a company called Front Row, and I used to do some testing with that company for their products. And so I'm just fortunate to use that sound system. It's actually called a sound amplification system. And so anywhere that I'm at in the classroom, my sound is the same. Or there's also a student mic, so we can pass a student mic around and really be able to hear the students talking. And for some of those quiet students, it's really nice to, for their voice to be heard. And so in the discussion, you will see that. Is that Good afternoon, fifth graders. We've been waiting so long to talk about this story, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And we're excited to talk.
talk about it today. I can't wait to hear your ideas about the story. I think it's a fantastic story. I'd like to remind you about the discussion helpers and how important they are for when you're discussing to try to use them as much as possible so that we can build on our ideas. So that's just a reminder. The first one is to uh, clarify. So if someone has something that is um, that you're not quite sure exactly what they mean, please feel free to ask them to clarify. Um, this one is to cite evidence, right? That's a really important one, especially with this book. There's so many excellent photo uh, pictures, illustrations, and um, and words in there that you might want to cite. It's okay to ask people to cite evidence if they haven't done that. Um, what's that? What, what's someone over there? Pulling ideas together to summarize is an excellent thing to do right before you ask another question. You might want to summarize what other uh, what other students have already said. And the last thing to build ideas, you're really already very good at building ideas. So keep that one up. It's real, that really is the whole goal of this whole project that we're working on, and it's to build ideas together. So I've seen that you are very, very good at it. So keep going on that one. And let me try to focus on the other people. So. Okay. So, um, okay, so you guys have already created your questions. And so you're ready to ask those questions that are going to kind of focus us on the text. And that's one of our goals that we have is to focus on the ideas in the text itself. So we want to make sure that, you know, it's great to have an opinion, but we want to be able to back up our opinions with what's happening in the story itself. Um, and I am going to have a copy right here of the story. So I can refer back to page numbers um, when you ask questions, or if you're just referring and describing a scene, I can put that up here in the document camera for everybody to see it and take a look at it, because this is such a rich story with great illustrations. We want to be able to talk about the moves that the author makes, too. Um, we also want to just make sure everyone keeps an open mind. Everybody has a lot of different ideas about the story, and that's part of this great format, is that uh, we can just build on the ideas that everyone has. We want to invite others to share. So, and I saw this in my uh, previous class this morning, they did a great job. Um, they even called each other by name, and they said, you know, hey, Natalie, what, what do you think about it? Or, you know, they brought ideas in. Someone might have a good idea and um, just not be ready to share it yet either. So it's okay if you're not sure. If you want to kind of pass your idea, that's okay. Silence is okay with this. It, that just means that we're probably just thinking about the story or thinking about the questions that we're asking. <coughs> so... You know, that's okay. Silence is all right. Uh, one person speaks at a time, and I'll have the mic right here. So we'll pass the mic around. And you can just kind of, you know, put your hand up if you want the mic, and we'll just kind of pass it to you. So back and forth. Um, and then we want to ask, when we ask a question, we want to wait for responses from others. So um, go ahead and ask your question, and then just pause for everyone to kind of think about it, and then they'll um, ask for the mic and go from there. Okay. Um, if a question is asked from Mrs. Sanderai, then we're just kind of getting the, uh, helping the conversation move forward maybe just a bit. We're focusing um, the conversation, but for the most part, we're going to stay out of the discussion. This is for you guys um, to learn more about the story through the conversation that you have. If we do ask a question, though, just look at each other in your responses. So, you know, we might interject the question, but it's kind of important that it, it centers back to you. So go ahead and answer the question, but look at each other and continue the conversation from there. Okay, so I think that's pretty much it. You have your groups, we'll spend about 15 minutes in this inside circle, and then we'll switch, and the outside circle will have a chance. Um, outside observers, be sure that you're tallying and really keying in on the discussion helpers along the way, and writing down any questions, notes, or highlights that you see um, that you can use later, possibly in the discussion or in your reflection at the end uh, today. All right, so with that,
I'm going to offer the mic. It looks like we already have somebody ready to ask a question. Let's go. Why did Fox think he was lonely? I think it might be because um, he kind of seems like a cruel animal, and so if he would try to make a friend, they would either like run away or um, kind of hide from him. And so he couldn't really make any friends, and then that did make him feel alone. I agree with Grace. I also think that maybe it was because he, maybe some, because I think some people, they have friends, and others have friends, but they don't have as many. So sometimes that, kind of makes people feel a little bit more like they have different feelings about how some people have friends and and if Fox doesn't have any friends he might feel different than the people like Magpie and Dog that do have friends and Dog and Magpie might feel different than how Fox feels because they have each other. Or maybe it could be possible that just for um, Ava's question that it could be possible because in throughout the story when Fox is there, it says he's it always says he's swift, so maybe he's just nomadic or something. Um, for my own question, I think that maybe. Somebody might have treated him, treated him that way, and then he thinks that everybody else is like that. I agree with everyone, and I kind of think maybe why he does, why he's lonely, is because he's a fox, and um, other animals might be like scared that he's just playing with them, and like then something bad might happen, like he might bully them or. So I think what we're all saying is that Fox thinks that he's just lonely and he's like worthless and then he just wants a friend but then he gets cruel and doesn't want, he just, he just thinks that friends are worthless. I think that maybe like Fox takes out his anger on other people and like that foxes, like when I think of a fox, I think of like sly and tricky and like they're not your friend. So he just like maybe has a reputation of being bad and, and like he doesn't have any friends. So he takes out that anger on other people. What we're pretty much all saying is that foxes kind of just cruel and that he feels just and just feels alone um because he doesn't have any friends um on to another question on page eight it says days perhaps weeks later um why do you magpie woke up why do you think it took magpie so long to wake up Probably because she was still healing, and so she, or maybe um, dog did something to her to make it so that she could heal faster. Maybe if dog just left her there, maybe she would, like in the forest, and had not picked her up, maybe it would have taken longer, maybe he did something to her to make it so that she would be faster but she's like still recovering. I think maybe she's still like nervous from the fire and um, she just doesn't trust anybody, but then she sees that the like, dog's nice and that he's, he's her friend, not an enemy. I agree with Amelia because maybe she was scared that it might be still going on or it might happen again to her. And that she just wanted to stay in there and wait until it healed. Maybe it was because maybe she just got really hurt and 
sometimes that happens when you get really hurt. So what I hear you guys saying is that maybe she just was either worried still about the fire, healing, and that she was mainly just recovering over what had just happened. On to the next question, why do you think magpie tells, um, or do, why do you think dog tells magpie he's all right, let him be, when magpie tries to warn him about maybe what could happen? How do you think that affect my, the rest of the story, how it was? Um, I think that dog's just really nice, and he didn't want to bother Fox, because he, maybe he thought that, um, Fox could, like, change and be good if he was, if he realized that he had, if that he had friends. I agree with her, because, like, I think dog just wants to be nice and be a friendly guy. I agree with Grace and Natalie because he's a really nice dog and he saved Magpie and maybe I mean didn't like to bother him Fox and it seems to me like he like he was nice to everybody if they're mean, rude, cruel. And it seems to me like he was like one of those persons. Um, I agree with everyone because like maybe it, Dog just was like, uh, he's not so bad because he would, Fox was nice to Dog, but he was just looking at um, um, Magpie, so maybe they're just, maybe he, maybe Magpie just doesn't feel like, like so happy, and then Dog is just like, oh, he's fine, he's all right. I agree with Savannah, and I think that maybe he thought that Fox wasn't so mean or cruel or he wasn't going to do anything because he just, because he didn't do anything to Dog yet or Magpie. Well, at least he, we don't know if he did anything to them. So what I hear you guys saying is that um, Dog didn't want to judge Fox before he got to new Fox and he just wanted to be nice and treat Fox nice until he actually knew who Fox was. The new question, how do you think Dog felt when he saw Magpie wasn't there? Maybe this kind of relates to mm -hmm. Natalie's question. Maybe, maybe he just thinks he should have um, listen to Magpie before. I bet he felt some self-regret because, like, he he thought that what Magpie he thought that um, Fox was okay because he wasn't really doing anything, and he like talked to um, Dog in a nice way, but then he realized like that he should have listened to Magpie. I agree with you guys, and kind of to relate to that question, do you think that Magpie, um, she might have felt a type of feeling like regretfulness um, when she was took into the desert and left alone? I think Magpie regretted that um, she just wanted she just wanted to fly and she left Dog to go with Fox. And that she felt lonely and sad after she was left there. Maybe she felt mad because um, Dog didn't listen to her. And maybe if Dog would have listened to her, like he would have protected her more so that Fox couldn't get to her. And so that she wouldn't have went to the desert. I agree with all of, you, all of you, and I think that um, Magpie was feeling regret, and she sh should have just stayed with Dog because, 
and she knew that Fox was like really like, <coughs> like mean and stuff, she thought, but she still did it anyway. On to a new question. In the beginning, was it a forest fire or did somebody do it on purpose? Or what happened, do you think? I feel like sometimes it's Fox sometimes. I feel like it's Fox or maybe just a natural disaster. Because Fox is kind of, you know, surprised and he wanted to separate Magpie with, do with dogs. So maybe he wanted to cause, you know, separate every, every family of an animal maybe. Um, I think that it was just like, like a natural disaster. Just like a regular force. I agree with Brian. Like, it could have been Fox. Maybe it was part of his plan all along. So, what I hear you guys saying is that Fox might have started a fire to maybe get rid of Magpie, or maybe he has a bad relationship with Magpie, maybe they've met before, and we might never know the answer to that because it's at the beginning of the story. On to another question, do you think Magpie was excited on page 11 when she is Dog's missing eye and Dog is her missing wing? Um, I think it's because she finally felt what it was like to be flying again, and she really wanted to feel that again, just the thought of being able to fly. I think probably because like, so, cause, like flying was like her life, and then so it wasn't all hopeless, because she finally got to do something like it. He was probably excited, but maybe, but I wonder if she ever realized that it wasn't actually flying with fox or dog. I agree with Grace, because, um, she, like, she was flying all her life. And that's kind of all she did. And then all of a sudden she can't do it anymore. And then she had a feeling and she was excited to be able to play just a little bit with dog. So I think that we are all saying is that she was excited and she was happy that she would get to kind of fly again because um, if I was her, I would be sad. And on to the next question. Why do you think the author ended the story like that, and why? Um, I think the author um, ended that because they want they wanted you to um, like think about it and actually like get in like interested about it and like say like what about this? What about that? What about um, Magpie? Will she ever? like get back to dog or dog will ever get back to magpie. I think the author ended it um, right there because maybe he wanted you to visualize your own ending in your own way at the end. Or maybe he wanted you to get interested and maybe make another book about it. Okay, I'm gonna interject just a little bit here now. Um, we're running short on time for the inside circle now. Um, last question, and I'm going to pose this to the other group later. Um, what's the takeaway here? What does the author want us to learn? I think the author maybe wants us to learn that like some people are your friends and some people aren't, and you should like be able to trust people, and you shouldn't go with other people that you know aren't your friends. I think that maybe he, like the author, he or she wanted to make it so 
that you know, kind of like Amelia's, you kind of know that some pe times you can't trust people that you don't know. Because I wonder if Dog actually knew Fox, or if he just ran into him and said, oh, hi, I'll offer you food and shelter. Come on, be our friend. Things like that. And I think that it's always good not to be a stranger because something could happen like um, Fox did to Magpie. I think the other one is to learn that you should stay with your friends and don't trust other people. And, you, and even if you can't do something and you want to do it really badly and somebody can offer you that, even if you don't know, you should go with them. I think what the author wanted us to learn was that you should get to, before you trust people, you should get to know them so that you won't, so that you know if they're like lying or not. So what I hear y'all saying is that just just because you like like you talk to them doesn't mean they're true friends and you don't need to don't need to actually like go with them if you don't know them. Um I think I agree with all of you, but I also think that they could be um to always to know like who your real friends are and not and um not just trust them. So interject again just a bit. What makes you say that? What from the story um, from out there? Because um and like I think so if you're on my picture the way and the way the author ends it. Um, it seems like Meg is sad, and it seems like she realizes that she needs to start trying to trust off and not trust off. Well, thanks for sharing. We ran out of time for our first group. You guys did an excellent job. Nice work. So you get to switch now with the second group. Inside circle, just kind of spot up close. It doesn't matter where you sit at this point. Um, just be sure you're tallying up the discussion helpers as well. I noticed with the first group that there was uh, a lot of using that for discussion helpers. I noticed that there was a lot of putting um, ideas together, summarizing. I also noticed that you built your ideas on top of each other a lot. Um, I'm wondering about citing evidence. Is there an easier way that you could have the book available that, to, to cite evidence? Would it have been easier for you if you had a copy of the book in the middle of the circle to be able to grab the book? Would yeah. that help? Yeah. Should we do that with something yep. in the middle and try that? Set up a little top table right here. Yeah. Yeah. I have a table here. Do you have more than one? I have, I have two copies, so I can put two right here. So, yeah, there you go. And I can transfer that when I need to. Because it's really important to set your evidence from the book, and I think that really helps your discussion to move in you know, different directions. So maybe that'll be easier for you to do that. Why do you think the story is called Fox, not Dog or Magpie? Um, maybe because the author wants you to um, think more about like Fox's character traits and think more about like what Fox says in the story other than focusing more on my kind of dog. Maybe because Fox made the problem. I, I think the author called it Fox because they wanted you to like think that Fox was going to be important in the story and he's not just like a side along character that hangs out with Dog and Magpie. Do you think Dog, I mean, do you think Fox had planned to take Magpie out to the desert all along? 
Um, yes, because like he's always uh, in the story, he always like is staring at her wing, and she can always feel him like watching her. And she says that he stinks. She can smell his um, scent from the cave, and it smells like rage and loneliness. So she can like kind of tell that he's out to get her. I agree with Ivy because uh, the fox is staring at Magpie the whole time ever since they meet. And because Magpie I also agree with Ivy because the way my um, fox was staring at my pie the whole time, it looked like she would either want to eat her or um, take her somewhere where she would not want, or she wanted to be the dog, but she really wasn't. I agree with Ivy too because he was always staring at her and he, he was watching them run. If it was a forest, there is a very small chance that you would just show up at that cave. And so maybe the fox smelt um, the mag magpie and made up a plan all along. So what we're all saying is that like magpie and dog can kind of, well magpie can kind of see that Fox is um, looking at her and he's always um, watching her and he just is kind of out to get her. And on page 11, why do you think that dog would do that for magpie? And why do you think that magpie would do that for dog? Because they barely even know each other. Can you describe what you're talking about with page 11? Um, when sure. Magpie and Dog are, when Magpie is riding on Fox's back, because they barely even know each other, and Fox is like, Magpie is going to be her, his eye, and he's going to be her wings. Um. Um, why do you think that Dog would do that for Magpie, and <coughs> that Magpie would do that for Dog, because they barely know each other? I think Dog would do that to Magpie because when um, Magpie said, how would you feel if you couldn't run, that made Dog like feel bad for Magpie, so she, so he did, helped her like get the closest thing to flying. I think that um, they would do that because, um, because maybe Magpie trusts Dog since Dog actually saved Magpie from the first fire. What I hear us saying is, um, Dog probably felt a little pity for um, Magpie, and so he let her ride on his back so she could feel more like she didn't have a burnt wing. Moving on to the next question, do you think the animals were chosen on purpose? Like, why did they pick Magpie instead of a different kind of bird? I think they picked Magpie because she had a burnt wing and it'd be easy to catch her and do whatever she wanted to do with her. I agree, but why did they pick, um, because they could have made, the author could have made any bird have a burnt wing, so why do you think they picked a Magpie? Maybe because a magpie is like a smaller bird, so it would like fit in the dog's mouth. 
and it would be able to ride on fox and dog. And like a magpie is like, um, it fly, you can see it fly a lot, so like it symbolizes that she really does not like having a burnt wing so that she can't fly. Maybe it's because um, they picked one that would probably be easy to find the root and the forest and stuff. So what I think we're saying is that like um, they picked a magpie because it's like a smaller bird and like you would be able to find it in the forest where dog and fox are. On to a new question. What do you think happened to the forest on page six? What do you think happened to the forest on page six? Because it says through the charred forest over the hot ash runs dog with a bird clamped in his big, gentle mouth. I think um, it says like charred is because there might have been a like wildfire. I agree with Michael, and that would be like a forest fire because um, in forest fires, the trees don't usually burn all the way to the ground. They just get charred a little, but the underbrush burns. And it looks like in the picture down here that there's not much underbrush left. I agree with Lily and Michael because like the picture, you can see that the trees are kind of like, um, they look kind of burned and they're like falling down. And like forest fires usually do that to trees, they don't like just all the way burn into nothingness. And like the rocks kind of look more like pale, so like maybe they have been there for a long time. I would either say it was um, a wildfire or it was because of Foxy, maybe got a torch that they lit up from a village that was probably close by and just dropped it. Maybe there was a forest fire and it and it was just there so, and Magpie was there. So Fox grabbed her really, I mean, Dog grabbed her really fast and the hot ash was still on the floor. Maybe that is, with the forest fire, maybe that is why everything in this book is yellow and um, orange and stuff, like fire. So kind of what we're all saying is that like the trees wouldn't be completely burned, like the trees aren't completely burned in the story, and like that's why Magpie has a burnt wing because there's probably a forest fire. And on to another question, um, do you think that Dog and Magpie will find each other again, and why do you think that? Um, I think Magpie and Dog will find each other again, because at the last page it, it looks like she's about to fly, because it says she, begin, she begins the long journey home. So I think she's going to fly back to dog, and then, yeah. I disagree with you because it says it, that Fox is running through all these different um, places to get to the desert, and so we might, it's probably in Fox's run fast, so would probably would probably be a long way home and in the hot and in the water. They might not find no water and die.
Okay, I'm going to interrupt you guys again. Um, and I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the other group. Um, what is the author trying to teach us? What's the big takeaway here from the story? And I specifically try to give some text evidence, so we want to keep giving evidence from the story to support our answer. Um, I think the author is trying to teach us to like um, stay with the friends that you have because the friends that you have are probably better than the ones that you um, could make because if um, like Fox keeps trying to get Magpie to run away from like her only friend just because he wants her to go with him but if she just stays with her um, with Fox then she'll be okay I mean, with Doc. Um, I think the author is trying to tell us to, like, trust our friends. Like, it says Magpie tries to warn Dog about Fox, and Magpie turns out to be right. And if Dog had um, believed um, Magpie and just at least, like, um, figured out a little bit more about Fox, then that would have happened to Magpie. Um, just be because you want something, you shouldn't leave someone that um, might hurt you or something, and somebody that helped you with what happened, but what you hurt. And the author is trying to tell us that you shouldn't run away with a, um, someone you aren't even friends with, and you should stay with the friend, the only friend you have. trying to tell us that before you go places with people, then you have to meet them first. And going on to another question. Okay, I don't think we have time for another question. Is there anyone else that wants to talk about um, the theme of the story before we go on? Can I just interject? Yeah, as you're talking about the theme, it makes me um, want to just take it just a little bit and maybe in a different direction. What did Magpie lose and what did Magpie gain? I think that Magpie like lost being able to fly when she got a burnt wing, but then um, she gained the knowledge about Fox, and she um, also gained a good friend all because she lost um, the being able to fly. I think she like lost like a the wing, but then she like gained like a friend that can like run fast. I think she lost a good friend when she went with Fox, but I think she gained the strength because she like when she went away with um, Fox, she thought that she would gain a bunch of stuff, but she ended up losing stuff, and now she has to use her strength that she's gained to get back to her friend. What I hear we're all saying is that she lost her ability to fly, but she gained a friend and she gained strength. Okay, I'm going to interject here. So some of you are saying she gained a friend, and some are saying she lost a friend. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Did she really lose? Did she lose dog or not? No. So explain what you think and try to base your you know, answer on the evidence from the story. She gained her friend because she made a friend with dog, but she like lost her friend. She didn't really lose him but she's not with him anymore like she used to be. She's now all alone in the scorching hot desert, and she has to figure out how to get back to her friend. So like, she technically lost him because she's not with him, but like, she still is friends with him. She didn't even exactly lose him, but she lost, um, she kind of lost him by because he probably lost his trust in her because she ran away from him even though he had been nice to her. 
okay, with that, we're going to have to stop. So some really, really good discussion. You guys did a great job. Pat yourself on the back. Um, there are three questions on the back that we're going to go through real quick, though. Okay, go ahead and flip it over to the back side. Go ahead and flip it over. Okay, can I have somebody read the first question on the back side for self-reflection? Okay, we'll use the mic since. Um, yeah, go ahead. Nice and loud, though. Hold it up here. How did the class affect it? Effectively, use the discussion help list. See first page for a list of discussion help list. Okay, so on the front page is, are, is the list to refer to. Think about how the class used the discussion helpers overall. What you heard on the inside and outside circles for both groups. And reflect on that there. The second question. Pass it back to the man. Yep. Perfect. Are you satisfied with your participation in the discuss in discussion and use of the discussion helpers? What might you do next time? Okay, so think about your own participation. Were you happy with how you participated yourself? Or is there something you would work on next time? Um, try it differently. And then the third question. I'm going to pass it over to Ivy, please. What did you learn from the discussion that furthers your understanding of the story? Okay, so how did, how, after the discussion, what new ideas do you have about the story that you didn't have before? So, you need to reflect on those three questions. You're going to probably need to take those um, home with you to finish that up. Um, a lot of great, great ideas, though. There was, I, I noticed that we were a little bit, maybe, um, slanted toward a few of the discussion numbers. So that's okay. We'll be working on, I think especially, um, citing evidence is one that we'll be working on. So, great job. Great job. This afternoon we get to go through the protocol following up on the Learning Lab. Round one, we'll go through and share specific things that you saw or heard from the students. Um, and really work to keep it specific to something that you saw or something that you heard. Round two will be, because I saw this thing, I think that maybe. But really try to stay out of the assuming why in the first round um, and keep it to really observable facts. Um, and in all of the rounds, all of the times around the table, we want to make sure that everything we're saying is honoring the positive, open, collaborative nature of the learning lab. Like, we saw a phenomenal class period, and thank you for opening the classroom to us. Um, but we want it to be a really judgment-free space so that people continue to feel willing to open up their classrooms. Um, for the sake of protecting student privacy, let's avoid using student names in comments. So like, it can be, I saw a fifth grade boy. I noticed that two of the fifth grade girls, blah, 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 but not, I saw Joe and Mark will use a whip around technique for the first two rounds. And Heath and Carol, this is probably the most uncomfortable part for you because you get to just listen and it's really hard. And then in round three, you'll get to respond to some of the things and um, give some clarification type things. And then round four will be, what are next steps? What are your takeaways that you might take back to your classroom? So. Um, but as we go around, we'll go around as many times as we need to for you to get to say the things on your sheet that you've taken notes on. Um, but are there any questions before we get started? Should we focus on some of those four look look fours? I think um, I think those are ground. great highlight areas, but there are going to be other things that okay. we saw and noticed that might play in also. Okay. And so that's totally fine if there's something extra. And I have my computer here, so if there's something specific that you want to mention that you saw students using, and it's something that we had in the Google Drive folder, I'm happy to have that up on the screen and open it so we can refer to it together. Other questions before we get going? All right, let's see, start with you. 
Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm thinking about the number one look for role of the teacher versus the role of the student. Um, I saw teachers early on setting a scene uh, and reminding students of um, the uh, discussion helpers. Um, I heard students doing a really great job of building upon the ideas of their classmates. I heard, I literally heard everybody very well, and so I saw or heard the effective use of the sound system. Um, I heard the students using the, um, the you say or ask ideas effectively. Um, as I was looking around, I saw uh, the setup for the classroom and how there was that circle aspect, but they also seemed to have an angle towards um, the TV and at least one of the um, teachers in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> I saw a young lady, the first time she spoke um, in the first rotation to talk about the, that flying was her life and everything wasn't hopeless, and that just really struck a chord with me. It was the first time that I think she was one of the quieter kiddos who wasn't reaching for the mic, per se, and uh, so it was just really apparent to me that they all had something to offer to the, to the conversation. I saw um, uh, evidence of student thinking at a deep level by um, instances like what uh, Zach just brought up, um, and also the uh, questions that they were bringing to the conversation. Um, I saw that it was hard for some of the students in the second outer circle to really not jump in and answer the questions, <laughs> that they were really anxious and wanting to, they not anxious, but they were really wanting to answer the questions. I saw that Every student really did have an opportunity to to speak, um, although there were some who definitely spoke more than others. Um, I saw that you teachers stood back during the, dis the actual, actual discussion and really let the students lead everything. There wasn't many times that you had to interject and give your two cents. They really knew how to keep it flowing, so that's nice. I saw the instructors doing a great job of Things that we were just talking about sitting back, um, but then closer to the end, posing really clever questions in order to take everything a step further. I saw the students being able to transition very smoothly, question to question, as opposed to, you know, and, and, the, and the conclusion happened naturally, as opposed to it being a forced thing. I saw evidence of um, beyond the uh, standards that were listed, which were speaking and listening standards, I saw evidence um, that could be applied to uh, language, I mean to the ELA 5.7, which was visual understanding. People were talking about the uh, visual construction of the story, and I also saw uh, people considering words uh, and their meanings. Um, and. Uh, how to take words, um, that would be um, 5.4, and I saw evidence of 5.5, which was story structure. They were piecing together beginning pieces of the story with uh, uh, ending pieces of the story and trying to puzzle things and stuff. Um, I saw that, um, back to the outer circle again, that even though the outer circle wasn't directly participating in the discussion, that they were still being held accountable with tally marking um, and still paying attention to the discussion. So they were still um, having an active role in the class. I saw, I think Steve actually mentioned questioning before, but there was, it's clear that there was instruction on open and closed questions, or thick and thin questions, is what I call them sometimes too, but they were definitely questions that led to deeper discussion. Um, I saw at the end there, I think, um, had to interject and just kind of wanted to redirect the discussion to say like what did Magpie win or lose kind of to focus them in a different direction of the end of the story. I heard the students <laughs> uh, but I feel like that's a big piece that wasn't part of those four but 
being able to hear the students and making sure that other students can hear each other by use of the microphone and the sound system. Yeah, I actually had <coughs> dovetailing off of that, and you mentioned it as well. I had written down the word facilitator, and I scratched that off, and I'm like, you, you move to the background at some point. You become a part of the wallpaper, which is even cooler in terms of trusting the students enough to remove yourself to that point. Um, so I feel bad that I wasn't in the room prior to see the setup to that, you know, and the ability to release them into that. <coughs> Additionally, you look at the standards and you, you talk about collaborative discussions, coming to discussions prepared, agreed upon rules, drawing conclusions. I mean, what more can you ask for out of, out of what, what you heard and what they were saying? As we're going around, you might find yourself with everything that you had taken notes on for that round specifically already covered, and you're free to pass it at the time. We'll keep going though for as long as we want to. Um, I saw evidence of students summarizing um, what um, other people had said, and then being able to move on. Um, I heard. Um, when necessary, the teachers interjecting and asking really students to encourage their citations and to really be bringing in the text evidence. So um, the kids were not only giving, drawing their own conclusions and inferences and some summaries, but they were um, encouraged to do the citations as well, evidence. I noticed a good sense of classroom community that there wasn't ever any, um, you know, kind of sighs or complaining that they didn't get the mic that time or that sort of thing. So it just seemed that everyone was really comfortable with passing the mic around and not dominating the conversation. Um, I saw that you were really focused on um, the student needs that like to help them have the best discussion possible by asking would this group benefit from having the books in the middle here instead of behind you? really thinking about how could this discussion be the best it can be. Chipping off of something Steve just brought up, I, I observed that when there was a, a lull in the conversation or when a student observed that the same point was being brought up multiple times, they were able to um, bring things together using one of those um, examples you said for them to summarize and then move forward when a lot of times conversations just keep going around and spinning. Uh, my last observation is um, I saw how quickly the kids were, is that called alliteration? What is it when you bring human qualities to? Precisely. Precisely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was immediate in the substance that they were offering, and I thought that was really mature on their part. Like that, I mean, it was just all connections to human qualities right away. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass. Um, <laughs> I guess my final, I... I noticed that students were really doing a great job at using their um, peers' names, and that when the one had couldn't remember the name, it was just a quick, respectful correction or just giving the name. So, yeah. um, my final one is I noticed the, a good use of self-reflection at the end to just draw it all back together and have the students reflect on their own participation. Really the past. Um, I think the final piece that I noticed was uh, I really appreciated that the two instructors were seemed to be mirroring each other um, so that the whole room could feel focused and students felt like they had um, a chance to do what they needed to do in the middle of the room, but there were teachers keeping an eye on things from the outside and either side. I think the only thing that I would add is that I noticed really gentle transitions, both at the start of class and between the discussion circles. Like it was, it didn't turn into chaos. <laughs> on to round two we go, unless there was anybody else who wanted to add anything in round one. Okay, so now we get to use the based on blah blah blah. I wonder if, or I think that. So now we get to think about the implications and lingering questions that you might have. Um, since we started over here and went this way last time, let's start with Zach and go the other way this time. 
understanding my computer issues, I did not have a chance to read the text, which, which is fine, only in that um, because of all of the responses I saw them make to the takeaway that you were wanting them to get through he, to Heath, I, I heard like some conflicting ideas of what friendship is and shouldn't be or should be, and, and, and so I'd, I'd love to hear what your thoughts were about uh, what you heard from the kids on that. Because I, while I was listening, I heard a lot of um, ambiguous language-like stuff or things. I was wondering if there were um, different things that I could do or um, that teachers could do in general to help students to stop and really think about the words they want to use instead of going to those kind of natural um, uh, words that we use just as kind of fillers. <laughs> right. I was wondering that too with the they were students were talking about um, their ideas of what the book meant and about not trusting people and I'm I'm curious too like what what were the takeaways from that story like what were the big ideas at the very end there that are are important I am curious about how the students knew when it was appropriate to move on to the next question, even though other students maybe still had their hand up to share, to respond to you know that same question, and then here someone might say, okay, on to the next question. How did they, how did they know it was appropriate to move on? Um, I guess as a lower elementary teacher who had had some of these students prior, um, it was the, you know, I had some of, some of those preconceived, you know, I already knew what some of, some of the students, how they were in right. class. But so I guess be, based on that, and truly because <coughs> I thought that I was noticing that I thought it was harder for the second inner circle to kind of have, to answer some of the questions or the deeper questions. I was just curious how the two circles were determined, if that was a random selection, if that was specifically chosen. So um, I, um, I had, this is sort of based on a notice, I noticed that um, several of the students started with uh, maybe and then would offer a, um, an idea. Um, I um, that, that didn't have a kind of, that, that didn't, wasn't, is super grounded in the story. Um, I wonder if, um, or maybe it's I wonder how to help assist that as a teacher because I notice that with students that I teach too that I wonder how I can help them ground their thinking more closely into the story without smashing <laughs> the conversation with, or the, without smashing uh, their personal experience, which I think is how most people enter a story, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So based on what I saw, and something I struggle with as a teacher is getting those observers to engage in the note taking. I think the tallying was very effective, but I wondered what your thoughts were about the level to which they were, you know, like jotting down observations. Um, and, and I find myself being having a hard time being explicit with what to look for and what you're seeing in presentations X, Y, and Z. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. On how you thought that went, I guess. As I was uh, watching, I, I wondered, there were a few students that uh, felt more comfortable talking or um, asked for the microphone a little bit more. So I was wondering how you work towards um, or work away from students monopolizing the conversation um, and allowing other students to have a, a, a time to <coughs> to speak and express their thoughts. Um, one thing I was wondering is how how much you were teaching of like the expectations, like how long you spent on expectations for this discussion, like actually teaching these specific um, discussion roles and. Mine was 
pretty much the same as what Gabe just said. I, there were some girls in the first group and then one particular girl in the second group who, who definitely felt more comfortable um, speaking. And so I, yeah, I kind of wondered the same thing. How do you keep some students from dominating the conversation? Because in the first group there was a, another, there was a boy at one point who had raised his hand to share and I thought, oh good, he's gonna participate. And then one of the girls who was dominating got the mic next and then they switched to a new question then after that. So just kind of wondered how, how that works. Kind of the same with both of theirs, but um, I guess it's, um, I truly noticed that with the classroom environment that there really was a trust amongst all of the classmates. However, <coughs> there's always that next element of how do you encourage or teach to not simply to pass to your friends that you need mm -hmm. to be treating everybody equally. And I noticed really that, yeah, there was a few that monopolized the conversation, but yet it was an equal passing. Um, so I was just curious of that. So a lingering question for me is um, uh, wondering about um, the, the reflection piece at the end and how, how to effectively use that um, to Samantha Lenny. I'm good. I'll pass. Um, something that I was wondering um, while we were watching is how do you start to have the conversation with students so that they're not just, uh, I think somebody mentioned it before, that they're not just summarizing and saying, I think we're all saying this, even though there's different ideas out there. Um, because at some point it sounded like, it felt like sometimes there were students that just wanted to get to their next question. So how do you um, instill in that there has to be some sort of a consensus or an idea, a true um, summary before you move on to the next point. So how do you establish that and create that moving forward? I'll pass. I'm going to build on Gabe again. Um, it did seem like they were almost always in agreement. You know, like, oh, I agree with you. I want to build on that. Where there was only one time where I heard somebody say, I actually disagree mm -hmm. with. So kind of more of that. Um, I don't know if it was just a a comfort thing, like, oh, I'll you know, agree with them, or maybe they really did all agree, but I'm just kind of curious about that. Um, I will pass. I'll pass. I'm curious how often you want this to happen in your mm -hmm. classroom going forward. Mm -hmm. Is this a weekly thing? Is this a monthly thing? Is this quarterly? What's the frequency? Goal. And how else do you see it playing out besides around a specific text with the whole class? Can I ask I think, yeah, of course. Like, I guess I'm curious too, how long did it take you to get to this point? <laughs> there aren't other questions. Then I get to release the two of you. <laughs> Can we get to oh, pass it back to you? Um, so in this one, you get to respond, respond to questions that were asked, but you can also share things that were triggered for you during the class period that you haven't, that you are processing now with us. Um, and if there are specific things that we don't touch on, we can certainly jump in, but for the first little while, it gets to be the Heath and Carol show. Go first. Let's talk about front loading first. Uh, that, that seems to be yeah. a common theme yeah. here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Because it was very smooth today, and there is a lot of front loading that has to happen for that kind of level of discussion. So. Yeah, there have been many, many lessons um, leading up to this point. And so, really, I see this as a culminating task that happens you know, one or two times a quarter, and not more than that. But I also see it being used in multiple subject areas. Oh, definitely. You know? mm -hmm. And so, for us, really it started with pictures you know a picture prompt and studying the discussion helpers um, but also integrated within reading instruction citing evidence mm -hmm. you know summarizing narrative text mm -hmm. so this this whole quarter has been a focus on narrative um, the narrative genre so mm -hmm. um, 
with multiple short stories to analyze and, and in whole class discussions that there are a lot of can you cite the evidence? Can you cite the evidence? And I mean, that really has been <laughs> a very common skill that we've worked on throughout all of the short stories that we've worked on. So they're very used to having that skill. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit afterwards. We were maybe just a little disappointed with um, the evidence factor. We felt like that one, um, they just didn't quite get there. And maybe it was because of the format with mm -hmm. uh, it being a children's book and just having a a more difficult time. The Socratic seminar discussion, because we've had one other discussion um, using a text called Southpaw by Judith Yorst. And um, in that text, it was right there in front of them. And it was very text heavy, too. So mm -hmm. um, I, we had better evidence in that discussion mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was something that we both talked about. Maybe um, something that you've done a close reading on where the kids have highlighted and made notes is, is an excellent um, way to begin this for them to, to be able to cite the evidence easily. And standard 5.1a talks all about preparation leading into the discussion. And so right now, we're doing a lot of scaffolding for them in terms of preparing. So we're preparing the text-based questions and uh, getting them to reflect on that. Uh, the theme question probably should have been reflected on a little bit more, and we mm -hmm. saw that come out in the discussion. Mm -hmm. We focused a lot on characters, and that's what ended up coming out mm -hmm. in our discussion a little bit more so, mm -hmm. um, and how they responded to the challenges. We were hoping it evolved more in the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, when we talked at the end about friendship, um, so yeah, that was that was something that I think next time as we look at this to continue doing this in the future mm -hmm. is um, how, what kind of text-based questions and how can we integrate those in the front loading um, of the text. Mm -hmm. But also not to the point where we're, we're, that's, we're, we're providing all of it for them. Mm -hmm. You know, we want them also constructing their own questions and gaining ownership mm -hmm. of the process. Mm -hmm. So there's a careful kind of balance Mm -hmm. uh, back and forth mm -hmm. with us asking the questions and then uh, and the students creating the questions and asking mm -hmm. themselves. So there was direct instruction on thick and thin questions, open and mm -hmm. closed questions, the kids been practicing that. Yeah. There, are, I mean, it's, it's multiple weeks of, of direct instruction mm -hmm. to get students to this point with, for all these different skills. Theme, get, we've been focusing on theme with these stories and working on, on how, how to tell a theme and, and um, um, with characters' actions and what happens at the end of the book, how that is developed into a theme. Are there multiple themes? So that's been another lesson that, that we've worked on too. Yeah, the lesson on themes really focused on uh, what are some basically theme-based topics and how to stretch out those topics like friendship. You know, well, what about this story? Is it talking about related to friendship? Um, and we also um, give them two questions. What does the author want us to learn? Um, and what did the main character possibly learn from the story? Um, so that was a question we interjected at mm -hmm. the end to hopefully um, get, get the ball rolling in terms mm -hmm. of that theme question at the end. Um, but I feel like going forward, another next step is when to use the discussion helpers and how. Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel like there needs to be more modeling for them. Um, I, I saw the same thing with the summarizing uh, in terms of they were s summarizing and then moving right on. And there wasn't, it just did not quite feel right. Felt a little rushed, forced, right? Especially that first group. I felt like the second group had some more depth. And, mm -hmm. and uh -huh. I'm not sure if it's because of the students or because they were the second group. They already heard the first group talk. Uh -huh. um, but I felt like that first group really didn't get into citing the evidence, and I just wanted them to, it, it was more, my, how does my own personal experience relate to this block? And, and we really wanted it to move more into citing evidence. And I think that was partially because it was a picture book, and we hadn't really done this discussion with a picture book. And it wasn't in one of those opening prompts either, the, the rules, I, mm -hmm. and it wasn't, I don't think it was in that list that you had mm -hmm. went through deliberately, and I wondered if it had been in there. If they wouldn't right. have been like, right. it was oh, one yeah. of the sets of discussion helpers. Was it okay? Okay, so they did have it, but it wasn't one of the specific okay. goals. Yeah. Sorry, I just 
I was right. trying to use But that. that could have been, you know, a focus goal for us too with that. And maybe it will be the next time because we've seen that that's something they need to work on. And that's that's the, the beauty of the process, I feel like, is that the goals can be changed. Okay. And in, in the past, we've, we've had students set group goals and individual goals. Um, we didn't include that because this is one of our first discussions and we felt like that was maybe just too much for them at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the future, then they can choose the group and discussion goal and reflect later in the self-reflection about how they did in relation to that goal. So if there's something like monopolizing a conversation, then they can choose that as a goal. Hey, I'm going to participate, you know, not, um, not too much or um, when needed, when necessary. So. Uh, yeah, they can choose their own goals then, and mm -hmm. it becomes a little more individualized. Mm -hmm. But I was I was happy with the participation because mm -hmm. I think all but two participated overall, mm -hmm. so I felt good about that. And I wanted to respond to someone's um, question about um, how do you get people to not have students monopolize conversations. Um, I think a big that, that they understand that this process is not about getting right answers, but about building understanding. And I think when you have that, uh, students are not so much ready to jump in to, to be right. And I, I think it goes back to the discussion helpers and, and how the whole thing is set up, which is what the, the strength of doing a Socratic seminar. You know, we're building our, our thoughts and our our, um, our evidence and, and our, our, our work. Um, together to, to, to come to a greater whole, a greater whole. Like I likened it to uh, an analogy of, of, it's like a spider web, and we're all in here, and, and we're all creating this and creating this big web, and how much of a complex web can, can, we, can we make through our discussion? And, um, and so I think when you have that kind of concept for the kids, I think that they're not so ready to jump in to, to prove that what, the, what they have to say is right. And she used that analogy with the students too, right away. Yeah. And it, it felt like they really understood that. Another thing that I found is the vocabulary that we use in class. It starts transferring into our discussion. <laughs> so, you know, um, the front-loading aspect of it, the concepts that, that you start um, instilling in them and the vocabulary you're using in each unit, that could be a goal even, you know, of the discussion is using those and having a bank even of those words. So. You know, I see this for me potentially using it later in social studies, you know, the primary sources. Mm -hmm. uh, but it could be a math problem even. You know, it could be a problem-based task that they're studying, and and maybe there's not as much prep before, uh, but they come in think having thought about it already to discuss and come to a conclusion together as a group. So, um, yeah, there's there are a few as far as the teacher's role goes, how much scaffolding and when to step in um, it's a challenge we I was holding myself back and I know you probably were too yeah. so that was a challenge but I feel like um, interjecting in, in, in terms of going to the next step uh, next time I'd like to interject maybe a little bit more um, with our next one um, and just to get them to the next level. Because mm -hmm. I feel like there were a few sp uh, spots that I, I held back and maybe I shouldn't have actually. I should have uh, referred back to the text and maybe stood up and pointed out something and it probably would have helped the discussion overall. Mm -hmm. So. It's hard to know. Yeah, it is hard. And we wanted you to see them in action too. Mm -hmm. so. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So should we talk awesome. about the room? Sure. The room design, that was it. <laughs> yeah. So there was, um, the way this room was set up was in, in rows of students facing the front. And you know, it, was, it, was, it worked out great for, for everyday work. But when it came to having a discussion then, the first that when we did the Southpaw one, um, you had desk, a group of desks in the center. What I did was in the first class, I just had them turn their desks like in the center of the room. Uh, there were probably six to eight students right there in the middle that just kind of turn, <clears throat> turn their desks so that they were in a, kind of a partnered up right next to each other. So the desks were back to back. This and, is a second hour class. Right, this is my second hour class. And it didn't work. They were, <laughs> I think it was just them being uh, further in proximity from each other. 
it just it didn't feel right and Carol stopped in and watched for a little while and there was just something wrong and so over the lunch hour we just brainstormed started moving the desks around how we needed to open it up so having it open really it changed everything. Mm -hmm. The afternoon class, things went. And they much came better. in then, and they were going to have that discussion uh -huh. that day. And the room looked different, and there yeah. was just like this energy in the, the room. The shock factor but, yeah. was, was good. Yeah. yeah. So the proximity, as far as being close to each other, does matter. It does matter. Yeah, they're, yes. they're much more open and trusting mm -hmm. with one another. Mm -hmm. And I think not having a thing, an object in, in between you too, I think helps. You just have chairs there, or if you had a rug, to sit on the rug. Um, I think really helps. Can you talk a little bit about the community in the class? How were the circles determined? How do you get kids to pass outside their best friend group? That kind of thing. Like what work goes into that part of the Socratic Center part? I think it's, I mean, this is me, you know, um, I think it comes down to just trusting and creating the creating a process that encourages that. You know, when I ask questions even and model it for them, I'm not ask I'm trying not to ask a lot of closed questions myself so that it creates or, you know, call on a student when um, yeah, they might not be participating, but not just calling on them to get their attention or, you know, randomly uh, by doing those kind of things, you start to you know, eliminate the trust, I guess, factor, I feel like. If you're, um, you know, just by me asking the right kind of questions really helps with that. Um, I mean, there, every activity, I think, builds it a little bit more. So, I don't know if there's a magic answer, mm -hmm. but what do you think? Um, you did the grouping. Did you, was, there, was okay. it random, or how did you do the grouping? I, it wasn't random. It, I, I won't say that it was partnered up by like opposite ability or anything like that. I felt like the two that I partnered up, um, because they were actually partnered up in pairs. And that so was one me. from the inside circle had yes. a partner in the outside had circle. Had a partner in the outside circle. To, to work on some questions, uh, writing some questions, choosing some questions and writing some evidence. In the lead up, right? yeah, the lead up. So, so that's why they were originally partnered up the way they were. And it, and there were two totally different groups, I felt like. Uh -huh. But she's neat. Uh -huh. that's neat. And I looked at the groups just to say, you know, are there some, you know, are there more leaders on one side than the other? And I, I felt like there were. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. having a balance of, because naturally there are some students that, yeah, are just going to take the lead. And I think that's okay. <coughs> um, it's just who they are. So, but I, yeah, I, I made sure that it wasn't completely, you know, balanced where. You had a lot of quiet students. Carol has talked to me about that though and, and said it would be interesting to try that, to try it so that some of those students might come out of their shell. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be something for the future. All the students who like to talk and who mm -hmm. tend to have the deeper sure. ideas first, right. put those all together and put the other groups, the other kids together and see what happens. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. the, the leadership does come out of those students. They just don't think of the ideas quite as quickly, but they do think deeply. So. It'll be great to take their self-reflection uh, and kind of come back to it as a class. I feel like we still need to wrap it up a little bit, you know, have a large class discussion about what the highlights were, what are some things that we need to work on as a class. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that self-reflection by me. Uh, for us looking over that and really seeing because they're very insightful and see things that we don't. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one way we can take that reflection and, and build on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Does the class look together at the reflection, the self-reflection before the next time you do this? Or do you pull specific things from it and group similar kinds of self-reflection into goals? And like how, how does it come back? You mean the what they would be yeah. on tonight? Right. The reflection? Like, do they look at their own again before the next one, or do you sort of synthesize it uh, as a way of helping to set goals for the next time? Yeah, I just, just look at it okay. and I synthesize. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. So, and there are other I, other factors. Obviously, our informal assessment is <laughs> yeah. part of that right. of what we see. So, but it'd yeah. be great to get to that point. You know, after you've done a number of them, you could do that with students. I don't think they're at that point yet. And we've talked about potentially having 
um, peer assessment too, mm -hmm. because they're especially they were already partnered up, so they could evaluate each other based on a checklist. Mm -hmm. So, is and maybe this just completely goes against system, but is is the outer circle necessary? And um, and if and if it is, and it seems like there's great stuff that's happening, um, how do you stop students from um, disengaging and? falling out of the conversation. I mean, the, you have the tallies and you have them keeping track of those things. Um, but what what things did you do in advance to help students from disengaging? And, if, and then the second part of that is, is the outer circle necessary or could you have two going at the same time? Not in the same room necessarily, but I don't know. I don't think it's necessary at all. Okay. Carol has <coughs> had multiple groups herself, just by herself even. And we talked about doing that. Uh, for this one, we felt like it was necessary to do an honor circle. Um, but I guess as long as they're mentally involved, you know, I'm not very concerned. Like, there, there are some little changes you can do to describe a seminar if you read about it, um, that, where you can stop and have the honor circle interject questions or, um, you know, have them meet with uh, their partner maybe that's on the inside circle momentarily um, and, and there are all kinds of different little changes you can do to keep them involved. I know uh, Bridget Storhoff has done uh, used today's meet before in Socratic seminar so uh, and there you could do a shared Google Doc even having them write down questions and see each other's questions so that there is a, a site where they're maybe interacting on the back yeah, channel. Like that. Yeah. We just, we felt like that would be too much of a Oh, and we had a seventh grade, I mean, fifth yeah, grade, yeah, fifth so, first quarter, fifth grade. Right, first yeah, quarter, yeah, fifth grade. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I feel like that's something you'll move towards. But right, with my eighth graders something. last year, after we read The Outsiders, um, the, so we brainstormed uh, questions and then came up with, like, big question topics, deep question topics, and, and students kind of signed up with which they wanted to talk to and then wrote their questions to go with, you know, what is a hero kind of question. Um, uh, and then, um, so then they just had their own groups, and, and we had like six groups around the room, Kara Reed and I did that, and they just did their own, and we just went around and, and just listened, and they were just they were just in charge of it themselves. So you can get them to that point, cool. especially if they're really engaged in the text. Mm -hmm. I think having a really engaging text is huge. As I've read about Socratic Seminar, if you have over 16 or 17, they say like, that's the magic number, you should have an honor circle if you're by yourself. That's just sure. what they say. Um, <laughs> Nobody has those numbers. Ain't nobody right, here. right. That's just, those are just numbers right. as I read about it. There's, yeah. I just keep seeing those numbers right. pop up. It's, it's a real yeah. practical thing to do if you're the only teacher in the world. Right, right. To keep the other students engaged and quiet so that you can hear each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. Discussing. I love those. And allow for everyone to participate and be mm -hmm. involved in the inner circle. They somehow build off each other. You know what I mean? Like the inner circle goes, and then uh, that outer group pulls in what wasn't elaborated on, or mm -hmm. something like that. I think, especially for for your subject area, you definitely could do that. Oh, I'm planning. You know, right. we're, this was <laughs> oh, you know, this was like one text, but if yeah. you're doing this on a social studies right, yeah. topic, you could go on all kinds. And they've of already done the work of the text searching right now in the unit mm -hmm. we're in, so I'm I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And there are different ways you can do Socratic seminar. I mean, it's this was one way that you can adapt it to. You can, you yeah, you can use a point system. Mm -hmm. I know um, there's all kinds of different ways to give award points for using discussion helpers or mm -hmm. um, you know using vocabulary or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to that too. Okay. So, kind of going off of that, thinking about how you assess them. At the very beginning, you had said, it's OK if you don't say anything. Silence is OK. So I mean, I'm just <coughs> curious. I know there was for sure one girl, maybe there were two kids total, who didn't say anything. So how would you assess that? Or you know, I guess what do you, what do, you do with that going forward? Yeah, how do you assess it overall? Because it's a process. Or, yeah, you, know. you can assess the reflection at the. You could do a pre, uh, a, a pre, um, a paragraph on, on their and have them talk. You know, write something about 
what they've learned, and then you could do mm -hmm. a, a post one where they talk about how has your learning changed for that question afterwards, and then you mm -hmm. could assess that way. I love right. that last that third question. How yeah. what new yeah. learning from your peers about what mm -hmm. the story about? Mm -hmm. One thing that Steve does, and this is an on assessment, but one thing that Steve does to help facilitate discussion when it's just a small group discussion go and, and discuss is he'll give the students like poker chips. Mm -hmm. And I started doing this in my classroom too because I saw Steve doing it. I thought it was a great idea. Everybody gets three, and when you, say, you know, when you make your point, you put your yep. chip in the middle. I was worried about the marbles in a jar. And marbles, like, there's um, something in the middle, and, um, and then you just keep going. And when everybody has theirs in the middle, then you take it back again and you, and you keep going. And, and I, I like that technique. Um, because uh, you know you're sitting there with your three and you haven't said anything yet, and then, then you, you're not having this respond right now, but you're thinking about you know, when can I really say something? I mean, the ones that want to dominate the conversation and really have to be strategic about what they want to say because they're only three. Is it worth spending? Right. right. Can I buy a couple extra? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I use those little marbles that are like, quite yeah, loud as poker chips. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so going back to, I've never read anything about Socratic seminars, so do they, I mean, they must say it's totally fine if not everyone participates then, or, I guess? Yeah, I don't think there's a magic, you know, number yeah. of times a person participates. Um, obviously, you want everybody participating, so mm -hmm. I feel like the smaller the group, the, the better it's going to be for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everybody says something a little different about that than I heard. So, do you have something? No, well, I can imagine that what you do with this assessment there is if there's no, if somebody didn't participate, you just say no evidence, right, mm -hmm. um, from that particular thing. But you've got, you have lots of rich, rich evidence uh, right now in terms of how people interact with each other uh, based on these standards. I mean, I think you could look through, I would think, you know, you could you could look through and see. Uh, you, you have lots of evidence about following agree upon the rules and carrying out assigned roles, uh, posing, responding to questions. You could... And if you're only doing this once a quarter, you'd almost need to film it to be able to go back and then assess that, you know what I mean? And, right. Yeah, or you just tally. I mean, you get probably get to that point where you... That would be awesome if right. you did that, but 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 then there would be, have to be other evidence of them. I would think, uh, you know, mm -hmm. whether it be a back channel conversation later or a yeah. work, or a, mm -hmm. I know you do online discussions as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, those are other and maybe it factors into the goal too. Mm -hmm. Maybe the goal is building on ideas. The goal is preparation. Right. So that's the one thing as a teacher you're looking for, sure. you know, versus all of them, you know, this <laughs> time, right. 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 And this, right. so this time I tallied to see what the participation was, mm -hmm. and I just wrote down any highlights that I had. Mm -hmm. That's what I did this time. I wanted to see how the participation went, mm -hmm. and then any patterns that I saw, because I wrote down, I agree with you, all of, I agree with all of you, <laughs> I just wanted to say that over and over again. And I, you know, circled evidence, and they were just, so I'm going to use, you know, that information in order to eventually change the goals and mm -hmm. that kind of thing, so. Yeah. Well, we're coming up on the end of our time here, and round four is next steps for instruction and support needed. So take just a moment to think on what your takeaway from yesterday and today is, and how what your next step in your classroom is. I like, think, Carol, you get to play this round. So like, what is the next thing? Are there things that we as instructional coaches can do? Are there things that we as a group can do to support each other <laughs> moving forward with the information from today? So we'll take just a moment of quiet reflection, and then if you want to share with the group, we'll head around and let folks do that. Is there anybody who feels like they want to go first in sharing? Yeah. Believe it or not, huh? <laughs> a goal I have set for myself is to get Heath and Carol to give me some literature as to what this looks like in a social studies environment so that I can execute one. Because <laughs> I, I really feel like my kids are, um, we, they're, they're close and I think they're ready. Um, the front loading I don't think would be quite as overwhelming in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And um, my student teacher did a good job of setting up a nice little debate. So I, it's kind of there, foundations there. So that's my goal is to, to get 
Take that from me. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to go around the table. Oh, okay. I find this stuff. Well, um, I, um, especially towards the end of second grade, I always try to get my higher level readers into more of a lit circle type environment instead of just doing guided reading where I'm guiding that. And I've tried a variety of lit circle roles before and tried to have them, you know, respond whether it's through blogging or through Seesaw or just paper pencil. And it always seems, like you said, Carol, that they're just trying to get the right answer. And I just, so this led me to just <coughs> Uh, more more pre-teaching, probably just for this guided reading group, which is how can I get them to understand the roles and that you're not trying to build upon each other and not just get that answer and move on. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to apply that into just some let's circle, let's circle instruction in my classroom. I was basically thinking the exact same <laughs> thing here. The second and third grade have a huge difference. Um, yeah, I tried something sort of similar a couple years ago with Holly Fish coming in to help me, but it just still seemed like there wasn't a natural flow of the discussion. It was very contrived, and um, so then I abandoned it. <laughs> but I, I need to try it again, and I think there does need to be a lot more front loading. Maybe I rushed into it too quickly. So I think moving forward. Uh, I'm just kind of selfish in choosing to come here because I want to use it for first grade, but also for the speech students I work with at the high school. And so I'm thinking about with the first graders that uh, I can't remember if it was either Holly or Shanna um, helped us create a video to, to, to develop um, conversations with between the first graders and giving us sentence starters so that they can actually listen and talk about agreeing with and disagreeing. <laughs> putting their hands down and looking at the person. And so then actually just taking that a step further, um, hopefully using some of these ideas. But then also, if I know that this is something that middle schoolers are doing, that I can expect that kind of conversation coming out of some of the high schoolers too. So we can actually have conversations and not looking for a specific right answer, but if there, there's a conversation that might lead us to a right answer down the, down the line. So one thing that I'm, th I've this, it was really wonderful to see another conversation. I mean, I I had that, that opportunity. So thank you so much. And as you were reflecting about uh, evidence, uh, I was thinking also about um, what I would like to try um, next because I feel that same. Um, Tension there with the questions eliciting a personal response uh, or a conjecture, uh, maybe kind of response. Um, so what I was, what I would like to try is connect the notice wonder thinking that uh, happens in the early part of this story. I mean, like as we're looking at that with the question asking. So I was wondering. <laughs> here's a wonder. Um, I wonder if by prefacing the question with I noticed um, the fox did this at this point and then ask like comma ask the question um, that that stitches the early part of the conversation right directly into the story uh, and the question emerges from the notice. Uh, so I might try and that. The, the evidence. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 It, it invites the answer to. Um, but you could use with social studies, yeah. right? Yeah. No, it, it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't want. I, I. I also wouldn't want to restrict myself to that. I, it seems that those would be that would be an interesting strategy to try early in the conversation. Like, at, and then at some point. It would want to be not just connections with in the stories, but but connections to bigger themes. Right? Well, the kids always want to say yeah. how they feel. How the story made me feel like X, and that's okay. And it's wonderful. Right. 
Right, but then getting honing but, in. But I wonder, I'm not sure if that's, those are exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, on page 19, the fox did this particular thing and made me feel mm -hmm. uh, right. like this. Uh, how do you? How did you feel about that? Would right. be fine, right? And right? How does that connect to the fox or some, I, I think you could, you could do it uh, either way, but it would connect it to the text. Or My goal is to use this with information when I when I do the information standards because I really have not used it much with the information standards. So as I explore that, then that would be. Something you know, maybe that we could work together to do. I've done it more with with, um, with literature, mm -hmm. so it would be interesting to integrate it with that. So, yeah, maybe we yeah, and maybe you have used it with information. Not as much. Yeah. yeah. But we could maybe collaborate mm -hmm. with our seventh grade kiddos because we have a lot of the same kiddos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did debate with my eighth grade, but that's very different. Mm -hmm. That really is more by winning, losing, point, and, and, losing it. and there is a strict, there is a time for that. Sure. Mm -hmm. But um, I think this is even more important to build on ideas. To build on right. ideas, yeah. especially in the twenty first century. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. right. you know, discussion. <laughs> right. And well, I'm over here. Right. You're over there. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> Having an open mind. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my big takeaway is just to continue making the process smoother. Um, the discussion helpers, I feel like, can be used cross-curricular in so many different ways. So how can I use that in social studies? How can I use this process overall? You know, analyzing a primary source and just improving the discussion and quality um, of what we're doing on a daily basis. Um, because I feel like there's just there's a lot embedded within those discussion helpers that just makes everything a little bit better. So, Well, opening your classroom can be a really vulnerable thing, and I just want to thank both of you for taking the jump and letting us all come in. And taking time out of your classrooms can also be a really overwhelming thing in the middle of report cards and conference prep, and then having to write subplans also. So thanks to everybody in the room for being an awesome group. This was really fun. Um, I'm here if you want to talk more at another point about this or about something else. But for now, happy Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.